Matt. Thanks very much, Kim. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you today, and I'm excited to uh, be presenting with you, Molly, on, uh, on the modern data architecture and specifically how that can be used for analyzing telemetry data. So uh, today I'm going to talk with you about Hadoop and a modern data architecture and how Hadoop fits in a modern data architecture, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Molly to give you some specifics on how Plot4 fits in that modern data architecture and how it can be used specifically for, for analyzing some data. So with that, let me go ahead and move us forward. So this is myself and, and Molly. Again, I'm very, uh, very pleased to be uh, uh, presenting with Molly. We, uh, I found it very interesting that she was a, uh, a Seattle bike messenger for five years. She was telling us that she put herself through school that way. So um, quite interesting uh, background. So let's talk about the topics that we have for today. Uh, so firstly, um, just a quick introduction, which we've taken care of, but then we're going to talk about the drivers for a modern data architecture. What do we mean by that? What are some of the reasons that we see an evolution in the data architecture that organizations are used today? And then specifically, how does Apache Hadoop, um, uh, a key new technology, fit into that overall modern data architecture? And then I'll turn it over to, to Molly to give you a demo and also talk about Plot4's role in that modern data architecture. So. So uh, pretty excited about that. There are still quite a few attendees logging in, and uh, Kim will address any questions that you might have about, uh, about um, the mechanics of the webinar, and then we'll certainly have plenty of time uh, for questions and answers at the end. So just one slide on Hortonworks. If you're not familiar, um, we are a company that sits at the kind of core of the uh, Apache Hadoop movement. Um, and we are very focused on enabling Hadoop to become a key part of that modern data architecture, uh, delivering on, on one Hadoop. And what we mean by that is we commit everything we do back to the Apache Software Foundation. All of our work is done in the open. We innovate in the open. Uh, we certify all of the latest Apache releases of software, uh, including things like the Apache Hadoop 2.0 just announced today. Uh, and then we make sure that all of that uh, technology can interoperate with the ecosystem with our partners like Platform. So that's who Hortonworks is. Now, let's talk about data architecture. This is a very simplified view, granted, about the existing data architecture uh, that almost all organizations have today. Um, they take uh, existing sources from a variety of structured and some kind of semi-structured sources, put them into a relational um, uh, processing engines, RDBMS, CDWs, other kinds of MPP scale-out architectures, and then interact with that data through a series of um, applications, whether they're bespoke applications, custom-built, or um, off-the-shelf applications for business intelligence or, um, uh, or, or other kinds of um, operational processing. Uh, and analytics. This is a stack that almost every organization out there has, including, I'm sure, some many, if not all of you. Uh, the thing is that uh, there is actually a lot of pressure on that particular architecture um, as we see it today, and it comes from uh, data. It comes from a lot of new data. We, we sit at something like 2.8 zettabytes of data that we currently have in 2012, but there's going to be a tremendous amount of growth in that data. And a lot of it is going to come from what we call new data types. Now, they're not new kinds of data per se, but they're new data types that organizations want to take advantage of and exploit um, and therefore kind of give new kinds of opportunity. And 85% and, and of the growth that we're going to see is going to come from those new data types. They're growing much more quickly than, than traditional data types, um, which are still equally important um, and as, as important as before. Um, in particular, there are things like machine-generated data, and there's a 15x growth in machine-generated data, this is all according to IDC, um, between now and 2020. So huge growth in data coming off of cars and trucks and airplanes and airplane engines and manufacturing systems and cell phones and um, communication networks and um, medical devices and you know, all of the personal medical devices and personal recording and all of the different places that are going to create machine generated data are just going to create a flood. Now, they're going to create a flood of data, but there is value in that data. Um, but it's going to grow and the total amount of data, it's estimated by IDC, will be 40 zettabytes um, by 2020. So it's just a tremendous amount of data. Now, 
that's putting a lot of pressure on that existing data architecture. It's putting economic pressure on the existing architecture, and it's putting technological pressure on that existing architecture. So what, what are we to do? Probably not surprisingly, um, the thing that needs to be done is to, to add Hadoop to that architecture. And this is what we've been talking about and seeing um, within our customers and prospects uh, as a, a, a modern data architecture. And that means Hadoop is a complementary component of that architecture. It sits beside the existing infrastructures. It doesn't disintermediate them. Certainly, as we'll talk about in just a moment, you might offload some of your existing workloads uh, into Hadoop where they're more economic, more economic or more technologically feasible. Uh, and that just makes sense because you, you want to run your infrastructure in a way that uh, uh, makes the most financial sense for your, for your organization. But we very much see Hadoop as a complementary component that sits at that data system layer. It's plumbing um, that stores and processes data at a very large volume at a much lower cost than, uh, than other systems that are out there today. But there are some key requirements that are going to help this modern data architecture be enabled that are going to help with the adoption of Hadoop. So let's talk about that. So first, what are, what are some of the drivers? We really see two principal drivers for Hadoop. One is around opportunity and the opportunity to find and build new kinds of business applications, many of them off of these kind of new types of data that organizations are looking to, to capture. So these are often applications that are focused on um, a particular business uh, unit, and we'll talk about that in more in just a moment. That's driver number one, opportunity. Number two is around efficiency, um, and this is really taking workloads um, and putting them in the most efficient um, uh, infrastructure within your within your architecture, right? Like water, it needs to flow to the lowest place, data, um, and, and certainly in terms of uh, an architecture, often that that data needs to and should much more appropriately flow into, into Hadoop as the appropriate infrastructure for storing and processing that. It really enables a lot of new things, um, and we'll talk about, talk about some of those things. But, but opportunity and efficiency are really two of the really big drivers uh, for Hadoop. Now, just a brief aside, really, to talk about the kinds of data. Like I said, many of these types of data are not new per se, uh, but they do offer a bunch of new opportunities. And that, I think, is what most organizations are realizing is that there is opportunity in these data types that might have been seen as exhaust data or data that uh, was not really valuable to capture. And, you know, somewhat in part because of the leadership of the and, and, and sort of where the big web properties have gone to try to take and do um, and find new insights out of the data, but also just because of the opportunities that most organizations have learned in terms of interacting with their organization, how they interact with their customers and prospects. They see this as a, as a main way to, uh, to improve services and products. So first is sentiment data, right? Understanding how customers feel about brand and products um, right now and over time um, via chat and, and, and blogs and rating systems and comment systems and all the other ways that you'd collect and understand sentiment. Clickstream data, the, the pretty clear idea that you're capturing the clicks and the web pages that are viewed and displayed to your customers so you can understand the path they take uh, through your website as they purchase products and browse and, and what are they looking for and what are they trying to, to, to achieve. Um, so that's clickstream data. Sensor machine data, we talked a little bit about it, but sensor um, sensors are on everything now. So um, whether it's your cell phone, your cell tower, your, your applications, your uh, cars, um, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, the manufacturing systems, production lines, there are sensors on everything, and that is uh, valuable data for optimizing the way that those systems run. Uh, geospatial data, so where is a service delivered or consumed, uh, very important in terms of customizing and tailoring offerings uh, and to manage operations. And then things like server logs coming off of um, manufacturing equipment, um, uh, applications, um, using that data to, to do more preventative maintenance and, and things. There's high value in server logs. And then a general category we just call unstructured uh, data, so text and video pictures, certainly something that, uh, that many have uh, worked to, to exploit, but the volume these days um, of pictures and photographs um, and videos that are available is, uh, is uh, astonishing. 
So those are some of the some of the types of data where there where organizations are realizing that there's new opportunities um, in this data. Now, going back to kind of you know how do we how do we exploit that? We talk about the the first driver. It's really to build new kinds of business applications off of these data types. And what we see really is organizations who are working to build an application that is very business case driven. So meaning meaning specifically things like uh, I want to have a, a recommendation engine, I want to improve the recommendation engine that I have for my customers when they're visiting my website or when I get them on the phone in a call center or some other, um, uh, some other way that I'm interacting with my customers through things that I send them or mail them or any other way that I interact. I want to focus what I'm doing with those. Now that's, that's a business-driven application that would leverage multiple components of these data types along with some structured data, right? You'd want to marry that up with their purchase history or your history of interaction with those customers in order to, to really customize and predict, um, uh, predict that behavior. Now, the way we see it is it's typically very much driven by line of business um, or someone in, in business IT that is driving the overall creation of that business application. But in this case, the application stack ends up being um, almost completely or entirely built upon Hadoop. And by far our partners for this webinar today are a good example of a, a kind of application um, uh, built on top of a Hadoop stack. Now certainly they can, as you'll hear more from Molly, leverage other sources of data, but um, Hadoop offers a tremendous opportunity for, for that users of, of applications like that to get additional insight that they really weren't possible um, or capable of doing, or, or they even maybe had to build a bespoke um, application, and, and now they have that, uh, that kind of capability um, in, a, in a more packaged form. But a new kind of business application is certainly one of the key drivers of adoption that we see for this technology, and it's to leverage those, those big uh, new use cases, those big new data types, um, in a way that, uh, that simply wasn't possible before because I can capture you know, a lot more of that data than I was before. So sort of clicking down on, on, uh, on what we mean by, uh, or what some of the additional drivers are, sorry, around modern data architecture, so switching to that second driver, um, there are a couple different key drivers. One is that it must have the key services that uh, a platform has. So Hadoop is an open source technology. Um, it requires um, multiple additional open source projects in order to make it an enterprise viable platform, and those services must come in a couple of different areas. They must come in operational services, meaning it has to be easy to install, easy to use, easy to manage, um, or, or people won't use it, or the, the, the operators in the data center can't or, or, and, and won't use it. Um, it has to provide data services. Right? It has to give you the ability to manipulate, analyze, capture, process, serve data, um, uh, both to, to uh, other applications, other infrastructure, um, and it has to do that via kind of a consistent set of, of uh, APIs. And then it must provide platform services. It must provide kind of consistency, high availability, security, other kinds of services um, needed by the enterprise in order to help it fit into that overall infrastructure. So, so key services are, are a component of the platform, an enterprise viable platform like, like the Hortonworks data platform that make it, uh, make it easy for organizations to, uh, to consume. So that's, that's the key driver number one. Second key driver is it has to enable you to leverage the skills that your organization has today, meaning yes, the, you, you'll have to learn some new skills in order to exploit Hadoop, but principally you need to be able to take advantage of the development skills that an organization has, the development languages, whether it's developing in C or Java or C++ or .NET if you're on a Windows platform. Um, uh, also to, to analyze the data through you know, uh, traditional analysis tools and also the ability to operate it through known um, uh, consoles um, and existing tools that you already have. So you have to be able to take advantage of the skills that are in the enterprise in order to, uh, to make it something that uh, uh, you'll be able to, to take advantage of and to drive. Okay, um, now uh, another additional important uh, driver and requirement for the adoption of Hadoop 
is that it has to interoperate. So we very much think that uh, Hadoop has to interop with, uh, interoperate with all of the different components of the existing um, architecture. As we said, it doesn't in intermediate, disintermediate those. It actually must interoperate with those. So it has to interoperate with, interoperate with the applications, exchanging data um, via a consistent set of a uh, APIs. It has to interoperate with the existing data systems, SQL, um, NoSQL uh, data systems, data integration systems like uh, Informatica and Talend and SingSort and others, um, and it has to uh, and it has to um, ma make sure that it can exchange data seamlessly with those systems. And then finally, with the platforms, it must run consistently on as a wide a variety of platforms as possible. Be that on premise, on any operating system, Linux or Windows. Um, in a virtualized uh, environment, or in fact, uh, uh, in the cloud, whether it's um, uh, in something like Rackspace or Azure or some other uh, cloud-based uh, system, or as an appliance. And this means that you can consume it in the form factor uh, on the platform that makes most sense for your enterprise, because we do realize that uh, enterprises are, uh, are, are varied in terms of the way that they've gone to market and the way they've deployed uh, the technology. So what that means is, uh, you know, from the standpoint of working with Platfora, they are um, uh, a key uh, component of that modern data architecture. They provide a um, uh, they provide a, uh, a consistent component for interacting with the data, a broad set of data, um, and. Uh, I think that uh, what you'll hear from Molly in just a second is more about how that interaction uh, occurs. Um, so I think uh, uh, Molly, lost Molly? Nope, Molly is coming back in. So you can see here from this diagram some of the systems that we interact with, including Platform on the, uh, on the applications layer. Um, and, uh, and what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Molly to, to tell you a little bit more about how Platform fits into this modern data architecture and give us a demo. Molly? So, John, while we're waiting for Molly to uh, bring us over to the slide, maybe you can ask a couple of questions. Um, hi. New question. Oh. oh, hi, Holly, you're back. Okay, so go ahead. <laughs> you know, I was telling... Um, John and Kim earlier that as a bicycle messenger, I was hit by a bus at one point, and I'll tell you, getting kicked off the WebEx made it feel like I had been hit by a bus. <laughs> well, we're glad you're back, Molly. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, wow. Some excitement uh, for this morning. So let's get into Platfora and how it enables the modern data architecture. So what I'm going to do is run you through a few slides about Platfora and then get into a demo of Platfora, analyzing our own Platfora telemetry data. So it should be very interesting. A uh, quick bit on Platfora. So Platfora was founded in 2011, and our product is fairly new. We released our first generally available software in March. And in the six months we've been offering Platfora, many companies who leverage Hadoop, Hadoop have become customers. And our, and our customers really Span the gambit you'll see here from organizations whose infrastructure exists only in the cloud, like Netflix, to companies with the strictest data security requirements, like Citi. And now we know all companies want their employees to make fact-based decisions. And when we started Platfora, we observed three common themes in this area. So first, while some aggregated data, like CRM data, was available to all areas of the business, there was a wealth of data that businesses were effectively unable to, attack, to tap. So specifically, um, data sources like those here. So sensor logs, telemetry data, social networking data, and so on. And from John, you already know why. It was cost prohibitive to store any decent period of time of data. And because of the size of the data, it took too long to process using conventional methods. And obviously, the data coming in didn't have perfect structure. So in other words, it was semi-structured and unstructured. The second theme that we saw 
was that for organizations that did succeed in tapping the data, they were able to ask new kinds of questions and questions that had never been possible to ask before. And companies that leveraged those resulting facts were able to increase customer satisfaction, offer new products to market, and ultimately develop a formidable competitive advantage. And the third area we identified was that to store and process all of these new types of data at scale, organizations were turning to Hadoop. And Hadoop truly enables the shift to big data analytics. Not only is it incredibly cost effective to store massive amounts of data, the MapReduce parallel processing capabilities enable questions to be asked that simply weren't possible before. So you have the emergence of the modern data architecture that John discussed, where Hadoop is the data reservoir and all the raw data is landed there to be combined and explored and ultimately to drive new and important insights. And now projects like analyzing every click on your website for the past two years or enhancing your product to log copious amounts of information about its state and usage patterns is a reality. And I mean, as a product manager, it is critical for me to understand how people are using new features that we roll out into the market, where they're spending time in the product, and so on. Understanding these things allows me to make fact-based decisions about where we need to invest. But here's the rub. How do you enable everyone to take advantage of this new wealth of data. You know, um, what companies typically do is they have Hadoop as a data reservoir, like I said, and they land all their raw data there, and then they use Scoop or other tools like ET, um, uh, Scoop or other ETL tools to mine a subset of that data into the data warehouse. Um, and then their BI analysts basically interact with that data warehouse to explore the data. And this process works great if you already know the questions you want to ask and you have the same recurring reporting queries. But the problem comes when you want to do data exploration. So the whole promise of Hadoop is that analysts can explore the data and find new insights. And with this model of IT basically ETLing the data into a data warehouse, the IT team is running around like crazy, fetching different data sets from Hadoop and modeling it into the data warehouse for the analyst. Exploration is supposed to be iterative. So you'll study a set of data, realize it's not helpful, discard it, move on to other data. And IT modeling all of this through a data warehouse simply doesn't scale. And I'll, I'll give you an example here. So one of our companies we work with, it was taking IT nine weeks to respond to a request for new data to be pulled into Hadoop. They just had too many requests and too much backlog to handle all of the requests they were getting. And one alternative to this approach is to have technical analysts and data scientists learn PIG or Hive, but obviously that takes a lot of time, and the batch nature of MapReduce means that that iterative, interactive exploration of the data is impossible. So Platfora takes a completely different approach. Instead of modeling all the data into the EDW, Platfora enables the analysts to self-serve that data from Hadoop. So without needing to know PIG or Hive or MapReduce, analysts can explore the data in Hadoop and not overwhelm IT with data requests. And Platfora does it in such a way that if the analyst is exploring the data, it's interactive. So no more waiting a couple of hours in between Hive queries. And, and the process flows like this. The data is landed in Hadoop, all the different types of data that we talked about. Um, IT provides a high-level definition of the data, and then analysts can explore the data in Hadoop in a data catalog and selectively pick and choose what they're interested in studying. And Platfora will then dynamically build a columnar compressed data mart to interact with. So, um, you know, uh, then they can use Platfora to interactively explore and drill the data. And I'm laughing because if you've ever used EC2 or another infrastructure as a service platform, you've known the joy of clicking a button and having a server immediately available to use. And it's really the same idea here. So the analyst chooses the data they want, and Platfora simply delivers them a cube automatically they can interact with. 
They can explore the data, discover insights, and then publish those insights back into Hadoop for other analysts to use. So it's full cycle self-service. And this really frees the IT team from the mundane and repetitive task of pulling the new data from Hadoop and modeling it into a data warehouse every time an analyst needs new or different data. And since the analyst doesn't need to know special skills to interact with Hadoop, the ability to explore the data and find insights is available to everyone, even someone like me who's not necessarily a technical person. So before I get into a demo of how all this works and how I myself use Hadoop and Platfora to analyze our own telemetry data coming from our product, I just want to give you a quick rundown of the architecture. So IT is responsible for defining the data sets, and all that is is a definition of the data coming into Hadoop, just telling, um, telling the system how it's structured, you know, is it JSON, uh, semi-structured, and so on. And then Platform's architecture for those software-defined data marks that get created are, are called lenses. So lenses are basically columnar compressed in-memory objects that allow the analyst to interact with the data from Hadoop. And Platform's in-memory layer is distributed so that uh, as you have more users wanting to explore more data, you can simply add nodes to the platform cluster, and we scale out horizontally. And then finally, we have a completely HTML5 web-based visualization interface that allows the analyst to quickly slice and dice the data. So having walked you through that, now I'll get into a demo of the product. And I'll tell you a little bit uh, just briefly about how our telemetry pipeline works. So. Um, the Platfora is instrumented with events that whenever a user does a specific action or the system experiences a, a, an error or, or, or is on a specific platform, it logs these events. And this telemetry data streams into our headquarters where we landed in Hadoop. Um, it's a mix of customer data as well as some internal data. And the data, some customers opt in to share their telemetry data with us, some don't. Um, and in some cases, some customers give us the ability to know where that, that the telemetry data is coming from them so that we can use it when troubleshooting support issues. The telemetry data can basically, any developer can add a log item to um, report a new piece of telemetry data. So the data streaming in is changing all the time. And you can just imagine as an IT person or, or a data wrangler trying to model all of that into a data warehouse dynamically and how much pain that would be. And so this is where, you know, Platform comes in and we will automatically mine that data and put it in the right format so that an analyst can easily slice and dice it. So what you're seeing is real telemetry data from Platfora, live data from our customers. And um, I'm currently in the VizBoard section of the product, which is where the analyst slices and dices the data and works with it. I'm going to go take a look at our telemetry data. And this is all of our, uh, not all of our customers, obviously, because not everyone um, sends telemetry data to us. But it's a subset of our customers, and you know, since we launched, and you can see this is the versions deployed, and you can see like this is a beautiful graph, nice, healthy migration onto newer versions of the product that we've released. And you can see we put out 2.5, and we're getting a nice, healthy adoption there. You can also see the small outages we had of our telemetry server <laughs> where the telemetry server was down and so we didn't collect any telemetry data. This just shows you a nice graph of how many telemetry events we're receiving per day. I look at logins per day, so just to see how people are logging into their clusters. You can see an interesting spike here, 800, not sure what was going on there. Also, be aware I'm filtering out one of the customers, and I'll get into why I did that in a minute. And then cluster startup time. So I look at cluster startup time because it can give us an indication of the health of the cluster. And what we want to see is cluster startup times that 
exist in the zero to two minute range. And we have some up here that are taking quite a bit longer. So I want to drill into that. So I have my telemetry lens, which has all of the information I can choose from. And I just want to look at versions to see are longer cluster startup times coming from specific platform versions. And sure enough, 2.5 and 2.4, we've definitely got some outliers here. So I can select those. Actually, before I select those, let me make a comment to my colleague and tell him, I can tell him, hey, go investigate this. Take a snapshot if I want and post this, and then he can go in and investigate why we have these outliers and post additional comments back. So again, very interactive, and the data is completely shared. Security permissions apply, of course. Um, but let's filter out these, uh, these outliers, because we really are interested in seeing the data. So you can see here just a very healthy flow. Looks like our new release takes a slightly longer time to start up, but that's expected due to some features that we've added. And so um, this is how I and support and development can explore our own telemetry data. And you'll notice how fast it is. I mean, I am isolating, I'm drilling, I'm pulling in different fields, and you're getting sub-second response time. And the reason we can do this is because we've taken that lens and loaded it into memory. So you get that very interactive flow. Now, I want to reset this because I've isolated it and I don't want people thinking this is only uh, the only data available. We support full undo and redo. So I can just undo and go back to my original viz. So as you're exploring data, if you go down a path and it's like, well, didn't mean to do that, or that's not what I was interested in, you don't have to reconstruct the visualization. You can just undo right out of it. So that gives you an idea of how you interact with the, with the um, viz boards and the lenses. Let me show you now what, it, what happens to set up these lenses and build them. So I'll go to our data catalog. And what IT would do is add data sets. So the data catalog represents all of the data that's available for use in Hadoop for the analysts and for IT and for anyone accessing the system. And I add a data set. I have my various data sources that I can pull from. I uploaded just a sample of our telemetry data here just to give you an idea of what it looks like. So I'm loading up a sample of that data. We support a variety of parsing uh, mechanisms out of the box, like Avro, regular expression. This data happens to be JSON data, so I can tell it it's a JSON object per line. I get a nice um, structured view of the data. And managing fields, then I can come in and add computed fields. So for example, the log time is stored as seconds since the epoch, so I can give it a better time by using all of these different functions to transform the data. So I can say, um, milliseconds since the epoch and put in our, our log time. And automatically you'll get that computed field which gives you a nice format of the date. And I can hide columns so it's very flexible. And I define references to tell people how to join, what data sets can be joined together to look at more complex data sets. And once that's done, the analyst can come in and build a lens. So on the telemetry data, I can now create a lens. I've not done anything in Hadoop. I get this friendly interface, which supplies basically a plus minus interface for adding fields to my lens. So I want the cluster key. I'm interested in startup time. I'm interested in the catalog page load time, what Hadoop distros, um, and UI resolution and version. And we offer some data information, some data statistics to help the analyst know, like, is this a very high cardinality field, or is it something that just has a few values, and what are those values? so that as they're defining their lens, they have some information. 
They give it a name. And then they can set up notification rules so that every time the lens builds, if the data meets some specific criteria, it will email them. So they click build, and now it's going to go off and build this in-memory lens, this columnar compressed object that they can interact with at the viz board. And I already have one built that I was using called Webinar Telemetry. And let me show you what that, what that does. So if we look at that lens, you can see the fields that I've selected. So I've got cluster identifier and cluster key and so on. And this lens is built, so I've not had to do anything on Hadoop as an analyst. And let me show you a specific troubleshooting situation. So this is, uh, this actually happened. It was a customer who, um, let me get rid of version here, who called us and was complaining of a high, they, they were complaining that the cluster was slowing down a little bit and that restarting it seemed to help. And so they were, they were seeing a high number of, re, you know, they were, they were restarting the cluster quite a bit. And so I pulled up this telemetry data to see for this specific customer, I filtered it to this customer, how many restarts were they doing? And you can see here there are quite a few. So the first thing I did was say, is it version related? So I brought in version to color to see. And yeah, 2.3 definitely looks like there are far more cluster restarts happening. But none of our other customers were complaining. And so then what I started wondering is, okay, well, they're doing things a little differently. They've got um, some API scripts that they're using and things like that. So let me take a look. I'm just going to duplicate this viz so I don't have to reset up all the um, let me take a look at their logins. So I can come over here, and here is all the telemetry data that I can choose from as an analyst that gets modeled from that raw data that comes out of Hadoop. And I want to look at logins. And let me change it so it's just plain date and put it to a bar graph, which makes it a little easier to see. So <laughs> look at that. So this is so interesting. So um, their logins, right when they started saying they were seeing cluster slowness, spiked to 15,000 logins a day. And it was so funny. I saw this, and I, I, I was working with support, and I said, look, up until the end of July, you know, if you isolate that selection, they were having very normal login patterns, you know, 50 a day, you know, lots of people using the system. but uh, in the beginning of August, all of a sudden they're doing 15,000 a day. It's like something is wrong. This is very likely because of this cluster sluggishness, and we need to look into this. And it turned out what they had done is set up an API script that was um, not reusing the session cookie. So they were just pounding the system, but logging in every single time. And so they were getting these 15,000 logins. And so we told them, hey, need to reuse your session cookies. And it's pretty funny because the person was um, on vacation, and so he turned it off for a while, and then when he turned it back on, he just didn't, he just decreased it a little bit. He didn't stop, re, uh, he continued to log in every time. But by that point, we had released 2.4, and we had made sure that the system was able to handle 15,000 logins a day. And so that's here in 2.4 you see then the cluster restarts, they stopped restarting their cluster. So it's just a real world example of a real support incident where we had live customer data coming in and support and I as non-technical people were able to leverage this telemetry data. You saw me build the lens and build these visits without any interaction from IT. So it really does realize that value of having all of the raw data, all of the access to that data so you can drill and explore. And by the way, if I forgot something, all I need to do is modify the lens. I can simply come in here and say, oh, I was interested in seeing the build number two. And I can click build, gives me a warning about doubles, that's no big deal. 
and now that lens is off and building. And when it's ready, I'll be able to drill in on that data. So that's the demo and gives you a, hopefully a really good idea of how Platfora uses our own telemetry data and how you can use Hortonworks and Hadoop and Platfora to really give that self-service access to all of the data in Hadoop without making IT's life a nightmare. <laughs> so with that, I will turn it back over to Kim. Great. Thanks, Molly. That looks awesome. So uh, before we uh, break into Q&A, a couple of next steps, you guys. Uh, to learn more about our joint solution, log into the URL we had over there um, on the slide, platform.com slash refinery, where you can learn more about how uh, both Hadoop and Fora works together. We have um, our Hornwork Sandbox. is a really good start for you guys to kind of get your hands on to do within the Sandbox. If there's different tutorials that you can use to learn how to process, analyze, and 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 query your data within the sandbox environment. It's a you know VM one node cluster you put on your laptop and it's everywhere you go, right? So you're stuck in a plane, you want to learn about Hadoop, you can definitely do that with the sandbox. And then the third thing is to follow us on Twitter. So if you haven't, do it soon at Hornworks at Platform. Um, we're pretty uh, active in our on our tweets about just big data in general and our partners. So, you know, if you haven't followed us, I would recommend you to do that um, and stay in touch. So with that, we actually have a couple of questions for John and Molly. Um, the first one, I think it's more for you, John, uh, from a attendee. His question is, we are having some dis discussion about data structure. I think we should collect as much possible as raw, as much data as possible and put it in a data lake for later analysis. Um, however, many people think we should provide structure to the data before we save it in a data lake. Most of the data are time value series. What are your opinions on that? Thanks, Kim, and uh, thanks, Molly. I, uh, I'll uh, say I think you really delivered on that, uh, on that uh, demonstration. <laughs> um, uh, so regarding the question, I think that's a great question. Um, we would say in our experience what we've seen with customers regarding kind of the strategy for uh, collecting data is, um, and our recommendation from our data scientists and architects is, really to move forward with, uh, with the collection process and don't go through the structuring first. That is really the value of Hadoop. By structuring the data first, um, if it's time series data or what have you, um, you are going to potentially lose some of the insight that you might get from that data. It might seem like um, ugly or unclean data, but the work you do um, might mask or remove some of the insight. So our recommendation and what we generally see, I'll call it not, not quite as a best practice, but I'd say common, common practice for sure, is to go ahead and, and set up just the straight collection of the raw data at its most atomic form. Um, uh, from, you know, from whatever source, from a single source or from a variety of sources, and then uh, go back and work with that data after. It's, it's certainly okay to go back and restructure and transform that data as a later stage, because um, then you can, you know, move it into another system or analyze it with some of the existing tools uh, that are out there, or, you know, certainly go against it with, uh, with something like Platform. Clearly we see with, uh, with Molly's demo, there's a lot of power in, uh, in Platform. Um, for, for investigative uh, analysis of, of data. So I think, um, you know, I think that we would recommend going ahead and, and starting with collecting everything in its raw form, pre-structure, pre pre-transformation. Great. Um, another question came in. I am, he's new to big data analytics. Or anal um, what's the best point to start studying and understanding the whole concept of Hadoop and big data? Uh, I guess I can take that one. I think... Um, uh, from from our standpoint, we've we've designed the sandbox as the best place to start with uh, with understanding the basics of uh, of Hadoop, um, everything from the very core concepts of just simple MapReduce and Pig and Hive, um, up through bigger concepts of data um, uh, data manipulation, data transformation for specific data types, um, and then we have partners like Platforma who are making um, tutorials as well. So we take you through and help you with the ecosystem and understand how the ecosystem un, uh, interacts with, uh, with the data. So uh, for, from our standpoint, it's the, no better place really to, to learn it. It's a single node VM, runs on your laptop, so it's really, really easy to use. 
Great. And Molly, I think this question is for you. How is Part 4 different from Tableau? Mm -hmm. So the difference between Platfora and Tableau is that Tableau, um, Platfora really focuses on allowing the analyst to define the specific data that they're interested in and bring that into an in-memory layer or a distributed cluster so more and, more and more users can be on the system exploring data and exploring it in that in-memory layer. The, um, the second real area is that collaboration approach. So having people um, share insights, share the data, and this whole idea of self, full circle self-service. Um, so as you d d derive new insights, being able to just publish that back into Hadoop for other analysts to use. Thank you. And then maybe this question is for both John and Molly, perhaps. What's the difference between Platfora Lens and HBase? Sure. So um, HBase is more, and John, you can jump in here, but HBase in, in my understanding is more for streaming real-time data. It tends to fall into that mode. Platform is more about exploring data after it's come in. So you can build a lens. We have customers who build their lenses every 15 minutes. But if you want the real-time streaming data, um, plat, you know, real, like sub-seconds and, and within seconds having the data available to analyze, Platform is not, not that platform. HBase would be the way to go. Yeah, I think, Molly, I'll just add that, you know, HBase is a key value um, uh, NoSQL database that uses uh, HDFS as its backing store. It doesn't have a UI. You interact with it um, via scripting or MapReduce or there are some, there are, uh, even through, uh, through uh, HiveQL. There's different ways to, to interact with the uh, with HBase, none none are like uh, like what you have in terms of a uh, platform UI. Also, great. Um, a quick question for the sandbox, John. Does it work with Windows? Yeah, uh, sandbox absolutely runs on a on a Windows virtualized environment. So you can definitely download it and run it in uh, on on a Windows box. Yes. Great. Um, a long question from Tree. I have a log which gathers user information sequentially. However, log records belonging to a user are not always sequential. So I guess this question is, I like to sessionize data per user. What is the recommended method to group data per user? And I think this is Molly's question. Um, so there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can either perform the sessionization as a part of the pre-processing step of the data. So the earlier question where um, we were talking about do you store the pure raw data or do you store it in a structured manner, you can do the sessionization step there. Platform can also do the sessionization step as a part of the lens build. So when, you know, when we build the lens, we do all the computations to calculate the computed fields and so on and so forth, and we can do the sessionization step at that time as well. There's, there's also a sessionization demo in our in our sandbox as well, so there's uh, multiple ways to, to experience and play around with that. Great. Does Platform work in batch mode or real time, Molly? <laughs> That's a good question. A lot of companies are looking to get the real time streaming and then be able to explore the historical data. Platform is focused on that historical data. So the fastest you could get the data into Platform, you know, is maybe every five minutes. But in my opinion, that's not real time. Real time is when you have the data in seconds. So, and Great. what I mean by that, just to be clear, once it's in the lens, then of course you're querying it in sub-second intervals and you can query and explore the data, but the data isn't streaming in every second. Great. Uh, John, this is for you. What are the constraints in offloading data processing to do? And what percentage of processing are you seeing such really being offloaded to do? So, sorry, Kim, it broke up for me anyway right at the beginning there. Can you repeat? Yeah, what are the constraints in offloading data processing to do? And what is the percentage of processing are we seeing successfully being offloaded to do? 
Oh, I see constraints uh, from offloading data processing to Hadoop. So, um, you know, I think you have to offload data workloads that make the most sense for the infrastructure that you have in Hadoop. So, um, uh, in terms of interactivity that you want or demand from your data, um, the other systems that you need it to to uh, interact with. We see things like um, ETL optimization, right? So, for large scale. Um, data transformation um, you know, that are that's easy and high, highly parallelizable that fits well into a Hadoop infrastructure make perfect sense to take and move those workloads over into uh, Hadoop. So large scale transformations they may have actually also been done in an EDW. That's a very common um, workload that we see moving off into uh, into Hadoop. It also has to do with the scale of that data when somebody wants to collect much larger scale than really is cost effective to to store in a um, in a in a structured uh, infrastructure. Then then we'll move those workloads off to Hadoop in order to. Uh, um, in, in order for it to make economic sense. So there's not really any, any constraints per se. It's all about your specific workloads um, and the data types that you want to process. Great. Thanks, John. And there was a follow-up question about the sandbox. Um, I think he's trying to ask if we have a sandbox environment for Platform. And I think for what you were saying, John, that it's in the works, and we're probably going to get it to um, – get it to our users as soon as we can, but that is in the works. Yes, um, in the works. Sorry. I'm yeah. just, uh, Molly, does Pathor do predictive analytics? Um, so um, today, Platform is used for interactive data exploration. Um, definitely on our roadmap, that's something we're exploring. Great. Um, there's another question that came in is, what is the difference between Platform and Datamere? So um, it's funny. There's so many players in the space, and everyone kind of has their own special niche. And, and really, the difference between Platform and Datamere, Datamere, in my opinion, is more of a product aimed at the data scientists and being able to explore the data in more of an Excel-like interface. It doesn't have that in-memory layer, so that iterative drilling, visualizing the data, identifying trends um, isn't, it, it, you know, Datamere doesn't have that in-memory layer. So, so that's the real difference. Great. And how much, and this is for you, Molly, how much big, how much of a big data can be pulled into in memory? So Platform is a distributed cluster. So um, we have customers who run terabyte size lenses. And the, the only limitation on the size of the lens is how much memory you have in your system. So as you add additional nodes, you're increasing the total memory that Platform can use. And of course, we're smart about loading the data into memory. So um, because it's columnar, we can load specific columns into memory. Um, and so even if a lens turns out to be one terabyte, you don't necessarily need to have one terabyte of active memory at all times. Great. And I think we have time for Maybe one more question. Let me just go through the list and kind of see the patterns of all the question. Um, so one question that came in is, is platform design more to be run in the cloud or can be run on premise? It can be run in either place. So we have customers, Netflix runs completely in the cloud. They're a pioneer in, in cloud infrastructure. They run completely in the cloud with Platfora, um, and other customers that are more security conscious customers run on on premise. Great, and I think the other all the other questions were about the recording and webinars. So you guys, um, before I end this, the slide and recording will be available on Hornworks.com/webinars, 
at the end of this week, you guys will get a nice personalized email from me telling you that's available. If you have any questions, you know, reply, send me an email, and, and if we didn't answer your questions, we'll look through the Q&A again, and we'll, uh, we'll answer them um, as soon as we can. So with that, I'd like to thank John and Molly for their time, and thanks to our attendees for hanging out with us uh, this morning. So thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Molly. Great. Thank you, Bye -bye. Jim. Thanks.